Well, hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. My name is Jason Levine, and thank you so much for joining me today on the Friday Masterclass, where today we're going to be talking about formats and really kind of an open discussion. As always, in the last week or so, a lot of people have been asking about just some of the formats I've been using. Last week when we were doing multicam, we talked a lot about proxies, and I kind of highlighted some of the benefits and some of the downsides of working in certain compressed or lossy formats versus some of our other uh, lossless or, or uncompressed formats. So we're going to get into that, really kind of an open discussion around this, and kind of compare and show you some of the really basic fundamental differences, particularly when you're working with, say, uh, raw media or 10-bit video 422 versus 8-bit compressed H.264 MP4 video, which is what we deliver in. And then we're going to sort of take a look at how this affects audio as well, because in audio we have the same considerations. Um, the difference is, is that, of course, audio files are significantly smaller than video. So even to keep them uncompressed and essentially lossless, in terms of space compared to, say, you know, 8K HDR, I, th there's absolutely no comparison. It's infinite. Inf it's super small. <laughs> Couldn't even think of it. Infinitesimally smaller? I, I don't know. In any case, thank you so much for joining. If you want to follow along in the live chat, I will be looking at this one, b.net slash Adobe Live. So if you've got any questions, want to get in on in the conversation, uh, please uh, contact me there. Coming to you live, of course, across YouTube and uh, Twitter and Behance on Adobe Live. So great to see you all. Hello, Matt Carlo. Taking a break from your audition project. Great to hear that. TR Bolin. How are you doing? Nesting was the answer to your prayer. Awesome. So glad I could provide that for you. Uh, Citrus Trail. Love the lessons from Jason. Always learn at least five new things. Oh, that's very kind. Well, hopefully you'll learn a little something today or maybe just kind of, you know, we'll reveal a couple of things that you weren't uh, intimately aware of. And then, of course, you've got Umicorn, Z by HP, Robert, Mustafa, Steve, Bliss, Reverb Mike, Voodoo Val, Michael Wheeler, Jack Watson. All right, Theo, Theo, how's it going? <clears throat> All right, Cynthia, Artisan, Adjust, Raris. Very nice to see you all. Thank you so much for joining. Okay, now, before we actually get into the format talk, Two quick things that I want to update you on. This is now becoming a theme of these Friday Masterclasses because we had a release this week uh, across, I think, almost all of the um, Creative Cloud applications. And among some of the updates in Premiere Pro, Remix has finally come. So remember, a couple of weeks ago, I went to go do something in Remix and couldn't find it and was... And then the week after that, I was like, oh, my bad. It was still in the beta. I thought it had already been put out. Uh, it hadn't, but it came out this week. So better late than never. So I want to show you just real quickly, Remix, where it is, how to access it, super fast. And then a couple of questions that arose on YouTube after last week's multicam, because I was going so much into so many granular details. There was something that I've, I neglected to show you, which is sort of critical. You may have figured it out yourself, but it's basically taking that nested... Um, multicam synchronized sequence and how to open up the original stems if you need to make individual color corrections or, or just tweak any of the individual clips living inside that nested multicam cut sequence. So we're going to do that. So let's go ahead just real quickly before we get into formats. I mean, of course, who, who wants to hear me talk about formats for an hour? I don't, I don't even want to hear myself talk about it for an hour. <laughs> Maybe 38 minutes. All right. So let's go over to Premiere real quickly and get into this. And I just want to show you this and then we'll get into the format talk. So much exciting. You know, I shouldn't even say that. Formats are exciting. They really are. <laughs> there's so many of them. I mean, there's many reasons to be excited about formats. Other side note, many of you will know Fridays, Monday, well, traditionally Monday, Wednesday, Fridays are in fact legs, leg days for me. I'm in this new program. I've kind of shifted it around. Today was uh, a pull day and my arms are on fire. I'd show you how they're bulging, but I wouldn't want to break any glass. <laughs> yeah, right. Aunt Pruitt, are you watching? Are you there, man? They're, they're, it's happening. It's happening. It's, it's going to take a while, but it's happening. Okay. Uh, multicam. So last week we were working on, well, we, I showed you a couple of different examples. One where the, the footage wasn't meant to be 
sort of synchronized again. We talked about commercials and things where you're cutting B-roll against voiceover, and we synchronized all these beautiful 4K clips courtesy of Adobe Stock. And then uh, I pulled up, <laughs> look at that face. Should, I probably should have looked at this before I opened it up. Then I pulled up one of my uh, still yet to be released uh, children's music show uh, scenes from 12 years ago. And we assembled this piece and we were cutting it together, but we were basically working in the multicam nest the whole time. And I never got to show uh, where the original sort of synchronized sequence lived and how to tweak it. And the reason for that was because as you can see here, this particular clip, which we talked about, so this was shot with uh, an old like Sony 720p flip cam. I think it was Sony flip, is that what it was called? I've already forgotten. I think it was the flip cam. Um, it was it was very dark, right? So, you know, first of all, that camera was just so lo-fi to begin with, but that's all we had at the time uh, in terms of this little little small mount. Oh, you can actually see it right there. Yeah, so I had it actually mounted on the uh, on the bar of the hood of the of, of the grand piano, but um, I didn't get a chance to like tweak it or correct it in the process because we were talking so much about cutting it together. So when you take all of your uh, original elements, and just to remind everybody, so here we had, you know, our our video or three videos, whatever it was, and then the uh, the stereo sound mix, the secondary audio mix of everything. And I'm just going to quick show the process again. So we went into this thing here, which is create multi-camera source sequence. And then once we did that, we gave it a name and we chose how we wanted to synchronize. Remember, we, we synchronized via audio. And then you can do, you know, different presets here, camera settings, what we want the audio configuration to be, all that stuff. And it builds this multi-cam sequence for you. And this is what we're looking at here. And then remember, we just had to enable the multicam sequence and then turn on the multi-camera toggle to view all the different cameras and could begin cutting. But of course, there's a sequence that's building that nest that created all of those. And it's here. And you can always tell the multicam sequences from the regular sequence. They will have uh, just these all consistent horizontal lines running together. This is the a standard sequence. This is a multicam. I, you know, it's a good question. I, I wonder why why, I mean, I understand the icon difference. I don't really understand why this is multicam and this is a regular sequence. I'm sure there's a reason for that. Kevin, are you in here? Do you know why that is? <laughs> Traps with Jason. That's another day. You know, I've never shown any of my fitness stuff, Voodoo Val, over the years. I've, I've had a, if I do say so myself, a pretty major physical transformation <laughs> kept under the hood, so to speak. Um, anyway, so if you want to see all of the original content that made up that multi-camera sequence, you are going to right click, control click, and we're not going to choose new sequence from clip, but instead we're going to choose open in timeline. All right. Now that may seem not super intuitive and that's because it's not. Let's open it in the timeline. And what you will then get, of course, are whatever was synchronized. So in this case, you can see we've got the three cameras here. All right. Here was the secondary captured audio on track one. And that, of course, is the track that's going to play through everything as we're cutting this together. And then there's all the master audio for the those three cameras. OK. Now, as mentioned, once you're in this open in timeline mode, now we can treat the individual cameras, the individual tracks as needed. So this one happens to be on track one here. All right. Obviously, just dark. I mean, it was a consumer 720p camera. That was one of the, I think it was one of the first that shot vertically intentionally. Now, this is 2010, 2011 when this thing came out. Many years before TikTok, many years before uh, Instagram stories many years before, shoot, a couple of years at least, even before Periscope. So vertical video was, you know, that was something that your parents did by accident because they didn't know better. Um, the world has obviously changed since then. But shooting in uh, in landscape mode, I mean, it, this camera was, yeah, it's consumer camera. It's meant to be shot outside. Anyway, once you're in this master stack, now, of course, we can go into Lumetri. 
and I could brighten this up. All right. Just did a couple little, little tweaks on there. Again, you know, I just <laughs> completely blew, you know, I say blow out the highlights just to bring them up. I mean, there's no shadow detail here. This is, you know, this is consumer camera. You can see I brought the shadows up almost a hundred percent. Um, it doesn't look too bad considering, but at least what this is going to enable us to do, of course, is when, oh, by the way, here was the original. When we're, um, when we're cutting this together in the, uh, in the larger sequence, now we're just going to have, you know, a slightly better looking result, of course, slightly, you know, closer looking result, I should say. By the way, it always helps to turn on the other cameras before you go back into um, multicam cutting. Good, good point there. If at some point we only have three, that's why there's no fourth camera. But if you're messing about and you realize, oh, where'd all the cameras go? Just make sure you turn them on. All right. So that's, that's that little multicam uh, change. Again, after you create the multi-camera sequence, you can take that same sequence if you want to see all the original stems and go into open in timeline, and that will allow you to do that. Okay, next, let's close out of this. I'm not gonna save that. Let's go into this. Okay, hello. And uh, talk about Remix. Okay, so again, Remix is now available for those who don't know. Remix essentially allows you to, or enables you to take any song, drop it in your timeline. And in this case, I've got my shark puppet music, which by the way, I saw Steve, Steve Kossaboom, you're in here. So my little shark puppet who happened to have a day off last Friday from school said to me after the stream, you know, kids just, just never do it on cue, right? After the stream, he said, hey dad, wouldn't it be cool or would it be cool if Shark Puppet made an appearance on your live stream? You know, sort of mm, from somewhere from behind where <laughs> probably stick him somewhere else and put another camera up. I thought that would be an amazing idea. Problem is now he doesn't have any Fridays off anytime soon. Um, but Steve, you said you what you I told him, I told him specifically you constantly saying, hey, we're Shark Puppet. So we might get to see the Shark Puppet imposter himself, although we won't see him. We'll just see the shark. I don't know. What am I even saying? Shark Puppet might make an appearance. I'm using my Shark Puppet imposter music here uh, for this video. And obviously, it's too long, right? So you can see the, vi the, the audio goes all the way to the end. And again, the concept here being, look, if I'm not an audio editor, I'm not really comfortable editing audio, you know, the easiest thing to do is just to, you know, trim the edge, go into your effects, go into audio transitions, drop a little fade out on here and then do something like this, see you there. You know, and just fade it out or that was a very short fade. Whatever, you know, wind it back a bit more. 10.30 a.m. Pacific time, this is one you won't wanna miss, see you there. And there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, shoot, you know, for, for many, many things, I'm sure people just fade it like that. But what if you actually want it to sort of preserve the beginning and the end and the middle and have, you know, a little bit more than just an abrupt ending. Well, that's what Remix is for. It's going to do all the editing for you non-destructively using AI, using Adobe Sensei, and it's it's really, really easy. We make it incredibly easy. You're going to find the Remix tool under the Ripple Edit tool. Sorry, I gotta move my screen a little bit. So if you long press and hold here, you will now see the Remix tool. Just a bit of curiosity, you know, if we were if we were live in person, I would be asking people to raise their hands. I'm curious how many actually go to the Ripple edit tool from the tools menu. I ripple all the time, but that's one of the few shortcuts that I actually implement. I'm voting that we make the remix tool. Oh, I didn't even change to it. I think the remix tool should be the default here because then it at least leads people into curiosity. Like I see like a, you know, uh, uh, I see some musical notes here. I'm like, oh, I wonder what that is. Then you hover over it, remix tool discoverability, you know, no one's gonna find that. You got a better chance of stumbling on the rate stretch tool. Also, how many people use the rate stretch tool as the tool? I'm not saying the function of what it does. The tool, I've never once ever, 20 plus years, I've never physically selected the rate stretch tool. <laughs> so I'm just curious. This is not a slam or anything. I'm just curious who uses it. Virtual hands up. Z by HP, you do because you forget the shortcuts. Ah, yes, hey, you know I get that. I don't, you know, I've maintained about seven shortcuts 
in 20 years. My brain doesn't like shortcut memorization for whatever reason. So I totally get that. All right, that's nice. Mustafa, several times a day. Umicorn's like, yes, shark puppet appearance, Steve. Okay, used a lot, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. Very good reverb mic. Okay, so with the uh, remix tool, here's how easy it is. Oh, and you know what? I need to first undo that I shrunk that uh, that audio down. Um, we make it super fat, super easy with the tool because you don't even have to access essential sound if you don't want to. The way that you would have done it, the way you were doing it in the beta was you were selecting the clip. I'm just going to change the tool for a minute. Shortcut key V, all right, for the move tool. And then you go into essential sound and you would tag this as music. And then that gives you the remix tool option. If you start with the remix tool and you just begin dragging the edge of your music. So I'm going to do that right here. It does all of that for you. And then as you may have just seen, it automatically opens up essential sound, brings you right into remix, selects remix for you, analyzes, and then does the remix. And you'll know that it's been remixed because you'll see these little wavy lines. Now, this is something that I want to point out that a couple people were messaging me about is that it appears that there's, it's not the exact duration. Okay. And there's a reason for that. Um, it's by design. And that's because, again, it's trying to recompose, and also, there, but don't mind this stupid silence at the end there, but it's trying to recompose in the sort of same format feel as the original audio. So very often, and you'll see it even actually tells you up here, plus or minus five seconds, that means that there could be as much as five seconds at the end because it's trying to maintain, again, the same beat, the same pulse, the same sort of cadences. That's by design. If you want an exact duration. Now, by the way, it appears that this, let's see, how long is this video? 13.05 and the music ends at 15.26. So there's about a two second extension at the end of this, okay? That's in order to maintain the correct pulse. By the way, you'll notice if you twirl down customize here, we can choose between, and they, they changed the, um, they changed the wording here. I'm looking at that now. So now it's number of segments. So that's your edits. So let's say that we wanted more edits. Let's see if that's doing anything. Oh, so look at that. So as I'm adjusting the edits here, you're seeing that it's adjusting sort of where the ending of that soundtrack happened. All right, maybe that one works better, okay? And then you have your variations, more melodic, more harmonic. Once again, what? <laughs> more melodic, more harmonic. What kind of, hmm? It should be more harmonic, melodic, more rhythmic, percussive. I'm just giving live feedback here, but you know, as a musical person, that doesn't really tell me anything. I'm bitching about it. <laughs> I bitched about it before. In any case, you'll see that as you adjust these things, it's dynamically making changes. And then if we were to listen to this, this little wiggly line, again, this is our non-destructive edit there. It should be pretty seamless. Let's take a listen. Classes every Friday, 10.30 in Pacific time. Better online videos. You can catch the master classes every Friday, 10.30 in Pacific time. That wasn't a particularly great one. I could hear that right, right straight away. All right, let's try these with the two edits. Tips for producing better online videos. You can catch the master classes every Friday, 10.30 a.m. Okay, that didn't really nail it at all. Let's try more, more melodic. We're talking about five essential tips for producing better online videos. You can catch the master classes every Friday. Okay, that was pretty good. Anyway, point being is that this is non-destructive. You can adjust those sliders, make those changes. If you want exact duration, I didn't forget, I remembered hanging on to that. You can't use remix. You're going to use stretch and stretch will allow you to do just that. It'll fit an exact duration. Now I should have trimmed off the silence here, but if I were to do that, right, using stretch, this is what I do. I dial in the duration that I need. It would be a little longer in this case because I have silence there. And then it's using our stretching algorithm. So it's going to maintain the same pitch but it's using a stretching algorithm. It's not cutting bits out, which means that the entire audio, uh, the entire musical piece 
is represented there. So it was originally a minute and a half or something. Now it's 10 seconds. So what does that mean? It's going to be the same pitch, but it's going to be really fast. Hi everyone, Jason Levine here. Today in our masterclass, we're talking about five essential tips for producing better. So this is why you probably don't want to use stretch with absolute time because it's doing just that. It's going to fit the duration, but it's not cutting anything. It's taking something that was two minutes and you want it in 13 seconds, fine. <clears throat> How do we make it this fast? How do we make it this short? Speed it up. It maintains the pitch. That's a nice thing. If it were doing what's known traditionally as a resample, that would be a combination of speeding it up, but also raising the pitch. So you'd get that kind of Mickey Mouse sort of, that's, that's, a, that's a technical term, by the way, the sort of Mickey Mouse style of music. That's not what it's doing. There are times where stretch actually makes a lot of sense and works great. But just to differentiate, this is why Remix isn't doing that. Because Remix is going, all right, you've got a verse, chorus, bridge, verse, chorus, bridge. And it's identifying those sections and cutting them out accordingly. All right. We could go on about this forever, but I think you get the idea. So ultimately, like all things, you know, in this particular one, I'm not super happy with those remixes. I could mess around a bit. As I've mentioned in the past, too, let me check this edit right here. In our master class, we're talking about five. No, barf. Uh, as I mentioned before, it behooves you to treat your audio file in advance. So that 10, four, six seconds of silence or whatever is actually not helping the remix process here. That's my fault. I should. So a better remix would absolutely occur with that silence slipped off, skip, edit. <laughs> A better remix would absolutely occur with that edit of the silence taken out. All right. So just food for thought there. Alvin of the Chipmunks. All right. Clip on this. Oh, all right. <laughs> Val, are you just seeing that? Am I wearing a Lego parody shirt that says Leg Day? Yes. It's one of my favorites. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> you don't catch it right away because you're like, oh, he's wearing a Lego shirt. He's a nerd. Oh, wait a minute. Yes. Paloma. My mind just believes the remix tool adds a freestyle rap to the audio. That is freaking hilarious. That is so funny. I could totally. <laughs> you're probably not alone. All right. <laughs> okay. Also, terrible stopped frame on my face there. Look like I need 18 years of sleep. Okay. So now let's talk formats, shall we, friends? Let's 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 get to the task at hand here. All right. So I wanted to um, actually start. Hold on. Let me just pull up my camera quickly so I can shift my screen. I just wanted to first start by actually just pulling up very basically um, a chart of supported formats in Premiere. Now, this is something which, uh, you know, if you go to the, if you're ever curious, and, and again, this is why I think I still get a lot of questions about formats, why, in fact, a friend of mine on the video team was saying, hey, do you ever do streams on formats and stuff? I don't know what's going on here. That's some Farrah Fawcett thing happening today. Anybody who wants to play uh, Charlie's Angels music. <laughs> um, we support a lot of things, and we support a lot of things natively. So just off the top, I'm just going to script. We're not going to talk about all of these, but, you know, when you go into Premiere, and this is, by the way, one of the things we're trying to make easier and less painful on import and export with this new redesigned user experience for import and export. You've seen me show it here on stream. We showed it at max. It's still available in the beta. A lot of formats to deal with. Some of these are very, very old and, you know, we support them, but they're just, they're not really used for video production anymore. Case in point, the very first one up at the top here, 3GP. Someone actually sent me a 3GP video not long ago. Anybody who's been in the, you know, um, smartphone, a smartphone user for a decade and a half or more, and I say decade and a half specifically, because that, that would take us right to the advent of the iPhone, circa 2007, um, you know, pre-iPhone video was largely 3GP. Um, it was meant to be sort of a small, super highly compressed, shareable, whatever that meant in 2005 format. Um, and it's still supported. 
Would you use it today? Please don't. I mean, no. You could. Maybe there's a reason to. I'm sure there there is. It still exists. But certainly not for anything social media related. <laughs> I mean, I just, yeah, there's just no reason. I mean, 3GP was developed before I think even full HD was, was a thing yet, which would be like 1920 by 1080. So um, think about that. AAC audio format, AAF audio format, all the Apple flavors. And we're going to be talking specifically, I'm going to show you a couple of these. Um, this was a big deal. So first of all, Apple ProRes, which again is one of those formats that offers one, greater than 8-bit support, two, 422 color space, three, 444 with alpha. So if you're doing things like lower thirds, you're building overlays, animations, and after effects that you want, that you need an alpha channel for, ProRes 444 is absolutely the best choice for that. A lot of people always ask, well, if I need something with alpha, what, what do you recommend? Well, you have a couple of options. You can choose Cineform. That's another great one. Apple ProRes 444 is another. Um, you can also use things like Apple Animation. We're going to come back to that. A bit more of a legacy file format there. All right. Uh, ProRes HDR and ProRes RAW, which is a fairly new format. Um, I haven't been given any content for it. I have an example that I uh, that I found online from... I'll, I'll, I'll credit them when I pull it up again. Uh, and this is, again, this is sort of a... a, a a capture into format. You're not exporting into ProRes RAW. Things may have been captured in ProRes RAW. We support that natively, all right? ASF, A sound. I don't we don't really use this anymore. This was a a sound document type where we could work between Flash and the video apps. Uh, ABC Intra, AVI, right? Still pretty standard in the Windows world. AVI support on Mac is, you know, can be okay. This is why VLC and Handbrake and those things come in handy a lot. BWF, Broadcast Wave. All right, again, DNX HD, DNX HR. Want to point out again, we have native support for these. Now, it used to be years ago, you had to use a QuickTime wrapper if you wanted to export uh, into Avid's kind of then preferred DNX HD format. We actually now have, and have for some time, native support for both of those built into Premiere. So you don't have to, you can still use the QuickTime wrapped DNX flavor, if you so desire, just like we have QuickTime wrapped H.264, if you want, but we have it natively, all right? GIF, H.264, HEIF, HEVC, which also just got uh, some updates for accelerated encoding, decoding, particularly on Windows, I believe, all right? All these various MPEG flavors, right? A lot of these are sort of so old, like MTS, Again, these are still supported. I, I often see in forums and things people having some issues with some of these older formats that were sort of in the post-DV, pre-HD world. And then all of these various MXF flavors, we're going to come back to this. Again, you see this largely in, you know, in, in broadcast, in, in movie making, in films. Not that you can't use MXF for other things, too. Uh, you, you absolutely can. But usually the people working with those are going to be doing sort of higher end production, although many other sort of prosumery camera formats now will support MXF output. And part of the joy of that is that it also supports multi-channel audio output as well. So you can have 4, 8, 16 in an MXF container. It just kind of makes the process a bit easier. Uh, and then some of these other, you know, standard ones here, of course, OMF standard for moving uh, between Premiere and things like Pro Tools or, or, or uh, AAF in the case of Avid, all right, or XML in the case of Final Cut Pro, all right, Wave, WMV, et cetera. All right, and then we get into some of the native camera formats. Now, again, I'm just pulling these up because a lot of these were recently added <clears throat> to Premiere. So again, uh, Ari Amira, so all native, and you can see with appropriate color LUTs applied as master clips on import, all right, Ari Alexa, all right, Canon XF, Canon RAW. This was a long, long, long request to have this. And we've even added, yeah, so there's the EOS R5 was recently added. I think there's even another flavor of that. You know, I'm not a Canon shooter anymore, so I haven't been up on all of those flavors. But all of these formats are native, and in particular, Canon RAW. All right. Uh, it even says your Premiere Pro lets you import and edit QuickTime formats natively, including 
Apple ProRes and .move files that Canon 5D and 7Ds capture. It's also worth pointing out that Apple ProRes is native on Windows too. So it wasn't for a long time. You could only import uh, ProRes, which you couldn't export. You'd have to use a plugin for that. Now that's native and has been for quite some time. CDNG, all right. Now, we're going to come back to this because you'll see that under Cinema DNG, we're showing the Blackmagic Black Magic Cinema, Pocket Cinema. Um, when these cameras came out, that was the format they were shooting into. Of course, now they have their own flavor, which is B Raw, Black Magic Raw, and that is not yet native. Come back to that in just a second. All right, Panasonic AVC and P2, Phantom Cine, all right, Red. So all of your red flavors, Red 1, Epic Scarlet, Rocket, Dragon, Dragon 6K, Komodo. I know whatever the new one is, I just heard where, you know, that support will be added soon if it's not already in there. And then all of the various Sony flavors, you know, which is wonderful. Again, particularly if you're working with S-Log3 and you have the appropriate LUTs, some of which we already ship with standard, you can shoot Log3, bring in that A7S Mark III footage, drop that LUT on there, and it's just going to look beautiful. All right. So tons and tons of different formats, some native some non-native, some compressed, some not compressed. So this is now what we're going to talk about and kind of get into this discussion. Johnny B. Raw, very nice. <laughs> All right. Just looking at this. Voodoo Val, this is such good info on things I do not understand. Oh, that's very kind. All right. MXF, what? All right, yes. Okay. Paloma, LOL. 3GP, if you wanted to make fun of UFO videos, right? <laughs> I mean... Like I said, I just received one the other day. So my first question to this customer, it was through Twitter. They were sending me, trying to show me something. I actually said to them, like, when was this filmed? Because one, I just don't know of any current phones that would shoot that format anymore. But also it just, you know, it, go back to YouTube videos from 2006, 2007. They were probably 3GP uploads. You know, they're all like 12 or 15 frames per second. They all have that. They're just, you know, the resolution is so low. You know, they just look like one pixel. So they never answered me. I never heard back. After I told them what to do to fix whatever they were asking, I was like, so when was this shot? They never got back to me. All right. Um, okay. So let's click over to Premiere. Oh, wait, before I do that. Gosh, I'm like tangential man today. Black Magic Raw. So for any of you who require... All right, blackmagicdesign.com slash support, B-Raw. You will see, as of uh, three months ago, they just released a new update to the B-Raw plugin for Premiere Pro. Software update adds improved Premiere Pro plugin stability, as well as providing general performance for Mac, for Windows, for Linux. Interesting. So, um, easy to access via Blackmagic. Still get the question, when are you guys going native? I don't have an answer there, but there's a plugin for it. OK, uh, and again, why raw over a compressed format? So that's going to kind of segue into this little bit right here. OK, so, you know, over the last couple of weeks, I've shown some of the new iPhone 13 ProRes 4K HDR footage, and it is stunning, right? We're actually looking at some of it right here. This doesn't look particularly stunning <laughs> uh, just on the surface, but what makes this footage particularly stunning, of course, is that because it's ProRes 10-bit uh, uh, media, it means that when I see, and it's also Rec 2100 color space, not Rec 709, what that means is that while I'm looking at this in Premiere at present in a Rec 2100 timeline, and I see like, oh, wow, this is all blown out. What a drag. It didn't look like that on the camera when I was filming it. If we go into Lumetri Color, and we make some adjustments and we can start by, you know, your, your first thought might be exposure. So, of course, we can start to drop exposure. And when we do that, I'm just going to zoom in to 100% here. All right. Right away, we start to see that, oh, wait a minute, all of that detail is actually there. Now, you don't even have to do it all via. And by the way, you can see, like, again, this is where we started, right? So all that detail is there. Pretty, pretty amazing. Now, we don't even have to touch exposure all that much. Let's just attack some of the, the white level here. Even nicer, right? And then maybe pull those highlights down just a bit. 
Let's go back out to fit. All right. So before, blown out, after. And what I love pointing out with this is, again, like look at the areas like of the, um, you know, of the trees and the sky here. I mean, I mean to <laughs> hold on. <laughs> I want this area right there. Got to see if I can find where that where where is it? Oh, yes, right here. Here we go. Okay, so yeah, you like look at this. And that green is so green and the blue sky is not blue. Just with those simple changes. Now look at that. We've you can actually see leaf definition right here. Yikes. This this looks like Jason's first experimentation with fresco. It doesn't even look real, right? It just looks like surreal content. But if I go ahead and turn the color correction on, you're like, oh, I see. Yes, leaves and blue sky and definition. OK, so again, this is. You can think of this. It is not ProRes raw, but I'm trying to make I'm trying to make uh, to, to give you sort of an analogy here. This would be like shooting Nikon, Canon, Sony DNG files, right? We have latitude with which we can fix, repair, grade, and correct those display discrepancies because this is not a, essentially a compressed file format, right? Now, this same video I exported without any color changes to it as MP4, a la H.264. Now, again, many of your cameras out there, including pro runs, but many of them will also if they maybe they you know can export if you're using an external recorder to something like ProRes 422 HQ or, or DNX, um, most of them will by default capture MP4. And, and some of them, I think now I even capture ProRes raw and other things. All right. So I just did an export of this content directly to H.264 at the highest bit rate possible. All right. So here is that variation. What's happening? Why is my shortcut not working? What? There it is. Okay. I don't know why my shortcut wasn't working for a second there. All right. So again, this is my corrected one, right? So let's go to the MP4. Okay. So, and maybe I'll turn the color correction off for a second. So I just want to showcase a couple of things here. So first of all, when you look at the MP4, I don't know if it's coming across on stream. You'll notice right away that obviously the colors themselves are slightly different. There's just a bit more yellow that you may notice. You may also notice that in the MP4, again, untreated, just exported directly from this master ProRes, there's even more blue in the sky. So you might be thinking, well, wait a minute, that's pretty awesome. It's compressed, yet somehow it retained color that you couldn't even see. Oh, very nice. True. However, this is the difference. And this is, again, this analogy with like raw DNG JPEG. Here's the JPEG version. So with before, right, what did we do? We came in here, we made some adjustments. Why does it keep doing that? We made some adjustments to highlights, exposure, white, and we were able to bring back all of that detail, right? Simple, awesome, amazing. Before, <sighs> after, ah. OK. Now let's go to our MP4. And you're like, OK, let's do the same thing. So let's maybe start with exposure, right? We know that's extreme. We know that that should bring back all those highlight details, right? It's just not. Because with compressed file formats, specifically H.264, but really, I mean, you could kind of liken this to almost anything. What is essentially now again, I did this, but I'm trying to give you an analogy of like if we just recorded into MP4 versus ProRes on your phone. Once the data is lost at the sensor, it's gone. And because this is compressed, you know, that's what we started with. That's just a darker version of what we started with. That day that detail's gone. Oh, how about whites? That doesn't even do anything. Look at that. Nothing. Nothing at all. It's because it's bypassed. <laughs> you dope. Let's grab the whites again. That's just making it kind of brown. It's not giving me any detail. It's revealing this same little piece of detail that I saw before. That's it. But we're not getting any more. So again, 
raw, essentially, <laughs> not really, 42 10-bit versus 8-bit, okay? Same, same as shooting raw on your camera for a still image or shooting a JPEG, right? If it's lost at the sensor, it's lost. So when you're thinking about what you want to shoot with and what you're going to want to do, this is another reason why if you are, by the way, shooting and you only have the option to shoot into a compressed file format, one, really important to get the exposure in particular correct on whatever camera you're using, but also it's a really good practice, and this was something that I've talked about ad infinitum on the stream here. This was back in the DSLR days. Philip Bloom used to talk about, you know, you want to drop the contrast. You want to drop the saturation. You want to drop the sharpness to give that footage the potential of having some latitude to bring some of that color and sharpness and saturation back. Because if you capture completely saturated, super contrasty and, and razor sharp, you, you can't really back it off in a compressed format. You can minimize it maybe, right? So it can be less contrasty, but it's still contrasty. In other words, you're just soft. It's like, it's, it's almost like an overlay. You're, you're just softening the overlay of sort of less contrast, but it's already been baked in. Or in terms of saturation, sure, you can desaturate, but it's not really doing the kind of desaturation that you want. It's just sort of pulling color away. Um, same with, you know, sharpness is, is the worst too. It'll desharpen, but it's just gonna make things blurry. So that's kind of a, you know, a fundamental difference. Now, once again, here's a case in point with, this is actual ProRes RAW footage. Now, I wanna point out again, so I, I um, acquired this from Film Plus Gear online. So this is about two or three years ago when ProRes RAW came out. Um, and this is another great example of, let me just zoom back out here. You know, I've already color treated this. Here's what the original looked like. And this is a perfect example to highlight once you get used to grading with not only non H.264, non-lossy footage, but potentially you know, there is still 420 10-bit. Take a look. This is a this is a flower right here. You can kind of see. Well, it's a, a silk flower. You can kind of see that it's some kind of flower. But again, in this format, it's just blown out. Right? Little color corrections, highlights, exposure, black level, white level, saturation. All the detail is there. And actually, and in fact, even some. If it's actually pull it back in even more. But this is what you're getting in true raw. I mean, look at that. We, we, we completely transformed this. Now imagine if that were H.264, that's gone. There's just a big white splotch right there. But ProRes raw, all the detail is there. All right. You already know this from, from, from imagery. It's, it's no different here. So that's the key. So talking about editing formats, production formats, export and delivery formats. What do you want to be working in? What do you want to shoot in? Well, ideally, if you can, you want to shoot in something like ProRes 422, ProRes RAW, if you can, DNX HR, which is more standard now, or DNX HD if you're just shooting 1080, um, because you're going to have more latitude to grade and correct and ultimately stylize your content versus if it's only M uh, H.264, you can still do it. You know, I'm the first to say, prior to the iPhone, all my cameras shoot uh, H.264 like 8-bit. So I just had to get really good at making sure that the, the original media was desaturated, not completely, because again, if you take all the color out in compressed file formats, you're not gonna be able to put it back in. It's gone, it's, the sensor didn't see it. So you wanna pull it down just enough but pull that contrast way down and just be mindful of the sharpness, right? With all these digital cameras, it's real easy to just, ugh. you know, some of the early GoPros, if you remember, they were just like, they, they hurt my eyes, they were so sharp. And the only really way to, to sort of take the edge off was to, I used to say, use something like a, like a film stock LUT or in Lumetri, we've got the, you know, the faded film option here, which does just that, it kind of gives it a, a more low contrast film-like aesthetic. You can see it right there. It just kind of makes things a little bit creamier, a little bit smoother. 
I happen to really love that look. Some people don't, right? But again, just kind of a before and after here. It is kind of amazing at how much how much data is is revealed after the fact. Okay, you know this is another one. This is uh, again MP4 version. You've got all this blown out area on the ground. I try and adjust exposure. It brought back some of it. It it, it saw some, right? That's actually pretty good. Blown out, a little less blown out. But this one's better. Here's its uh its ProRes counterpart, but with this, yeah, I mean, it's amazing because you're actually seeing, yes, that was the color because it's the sun, right? And we can really bring back all the detail, you know, everything, right? Before, this looks blown out, after, all the lines, amazing, okay? So, you know this. You've done it with images, it works the same here. When you go to do your exports, this is what you want to be thinking about. Now, again, formats to, to think about to avoid editing in. Well, I've said it before. Honestly, H.264 can be pretty heavy depending upon the kind of machine you're using, and especially if you're working in like 4K. So this is why we use proxies. Now, we did this last week. I'm not going to go into the whole proxy discussion again, but um, if you need to make a proxy, Right, which is a lighter weight, smaller version of your media. I highly recommend for your format, choose QuickTime and then choose one of the either ProRes, Cineform, or you, you wouldn't use this DNX because it's for VR, but you can make one of your own or use another one. ProRes or Cineform, and preferably, I always go with just low resolution because it's really just going to help me edit that much more quickly. I'll grade with the with the master footage or I'll do any kind of color corrections or tweaks, but for editing, so much better, all right? And similarly, if you are working in ProRes RAW or B-RAW or ProRes 422HQ or ProRes 444 or Cineform or MXF, many of those formats are actually automatically kind of accelerated for export, but also just function and perform really smoothly. And in particular on the new M1 chipsets, uh, some really dramatic performance increases. So it behooves you to work in those uh, pro level formats, not only for color, not only for grading and latitude purposes, but also for efficacy in, in terms of editing speed. They're just going to work better. All right. And the same also applies for audio, right? So this is once again, our shark puppet cut here. This is the master wave file 32 bit uh, 32-bit float, 48K. You can see exactly what this looks like. Now, again, for those of you not seeing this view, this is our spectral frequency display. All right, showing us frequency over time. And, uh, you know, if we zoom in to 24K, again, this was all synth stuff with some real drums and bass. You know, we're capturing, you're seeing all of the, the, the program content all the way up to 24K, right? Erland has a slightly unrelated question. Do you have a video or could you make one on your setup? <laughs> this has been asked so many times. I've still not done it. I guess I should do it at some point. I owe you that. Well, maybe not you personally, but I, I, I need to do one of those. Erland, thank you for reminding me. Matthias, how are you? Shankar, how are you? <laughs> 3GP, if you have videos from 15 years ago that you want to use today in another video. Oh, yes. <laughs> I mean, that's it, right? That's essentially... That's essentially why. Okay. So what I'm trying to show you here is uncompressed PCM wave data is going to give you all of the frequency content, right? Now it's much easier actually to see, not to confuse you, what lossiness looks like, not lossless, lossiness, losing things with audio formats using the spectral frequency display. So I'm going to take this same 32-bit wave file and let's go ahead and export this as an MP3. Now, just for the sake of frequency, I'm going to keep it the same as source. I'll keep it 48K. We'll keep it stereo. All right. Now, you're, you don't really have 32-bit MP3s, so we'll, we'll do 16. That's standard. We're going to dither it, okay? And then we just need to choose the bit rate. Now, you've heard me talk about this a lot, especially, you know, again, MP3 is the delivery format. It's the end of the end of the end. After 87,000 reviews, the final audio is MP3. 
if somebody is like, oh, here's the, here's the new uh, dialogue replacement that we cut the other day with our artist, or here's the new voiceover, and they give you an MP3, uh, cut them off from your life. Not, no, don't, no. MP3 is not a production format. Anyone who gives you an MP3 and they're like, nope, that's the master, you have to question, unless that was, th that was it, like, it happens, right? Oh, we lost the original recording, the MP3, the backup, this is all we have, thank goodness we have it. Okay, but never, ever try and work in MP3 because it's a heavily compressed format particularly if you exported them out of our software or any software for that matter, but you're going to see visually what happens. So I will always tell you export at the highest bitrate possible, 320, 256, if you must, any lower than that, there's just, there's just no point. You're just throwing away a lot of data. Now it used to be that 128 kilobit was the standard. So first I'm just going to create a version using that. Okay. Constant bitrate, CBR, 128 kilobit. All right. And I'm gonna I'm gonna label this as such, so um, I know I know where it's uh, where it's going. Why is my desktop not on here? Desktop. Okay, I'm gonna save it there. All right, click OK. Okay, and I'm gonna open this up on the desktop. Here we go. Okay. Now remember, I told you it's very easy to understand lossiness visually with audio files in the spectral view. And here's why. Because at the, the former, the once standard MP3 bit rate of 128 kilobits, do you see what happens when you export an MP3? With our sample rate at 48K, which means our Nyquist limit is 24K, which means the highest captured or displayed uh, frequency is 24K. 128 kilobit MP3, <sighs> it flat tops all frequencies above 16K, okay? This is by design, this is not a bug. It throws it all away. And it throws it away pretty aggressively. Now, I'm not gonna play this for you because over a stream, you're not gonna hear a significant difference. You might hear a little bit of swishiness, actually. But that's it. It just throws away that data. So what happens if we say, oh, you know what? I really wanna try and equalize you know, 15, 16 kilo. And you can see there's some, there's barely, remember colors amplitude. So we're in the purple here, that's super low amplitude. So I could come in here and I could try and like, oh, you know, I'm, I need to add a little bit of a uh, little bit of sparkle on this. So I'm just going to grab my shelving filter and I'm just going to boost around, let's, you know, let's do like 14 dB. Let's even go a little lower at around 13 K. All right. I'm going to apply that. So you can see it, it gave me a little bit more. Again, we're kind of amplifying stuff that was super low amplitude and it's amplifying other frequencies here. But the point is you're kind of amplifying stuff that's already been modified. It's already been it's, it's already been gone through with an algorithm and it's like, okay, well, you don't need that, that momentary piece of the frequency. You don't need that one. We're going to just preserve this one. That's it. And for this symbol crash, you don't need that, 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 that. We're just going to give you this bit. It's gone. And honestly, if you do that on a, on a, on a 128 kilobit MP3, it's just going to sound terrible and swishy. So here's the before MP3. Here's the after. Just flat topped, just flat out loss, lossiness. Okay. Now let's do the more standard, what you should be using 256 or 320. So when you choose 320, what this is going to do by design is it does preserve all frequencies up to that Nyquist limit in this case, 24, uh, 24 K, but it's preserving shorter transients of that media. So it's not continuous. <laughs> it's where there was a moment where there was just a lot of info above 16 kilohertz. It preserves some of that. Okay. So even at the highest bit rate, and by the way, this is a pretty good sounding MP3. Now, if you take a more clinical look, you'll actually see that there are fewer holes in between the mid range frequencies. This actually has more 
there's more, how else can, how can I say this? There's more smoothness in between zero to 16K on 320 than there, now again, we, we amplified here, let me deamplify. Okay, visually, you're not gonna see so much of a difference. You might just see that it looks almost a little more grainy on the 320 version. That's because there is more detail, all right? There's literally twice as much detail per channel. By the way, if you're unfamiliar, 128 kilobit stereo MP3 actually provides 64 kilobit mono left, 64 kilobit mono right. Yeah, that's actually how that works. So 320 is actually 160 left, 160 right, okay? But even at the highest bit rate, you're still throwing out a lot, okay? Now this one sounds a lot better. Most people on most listening devices will never hear the difference, but that's the idea. Lossy means you're throwing stuff away. And if it's a compressed file format, there's really no way to bring it back. So think about what you're gonna do, where it's going to go, and what the purpose of that format is meant to be, editing, production, post-production, or final delivery before you choose that format. And that's all the time we have, my friends. So thanks so much for watching. Have a great rest of your morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are in the world. And we'll see you again next time. Stay tuned for the Daily Creative Challenge. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.